You know, film critics and criticism is, there's no doubt about it, it's, it's still very important despite what people say and the way things have changed. And they have changed enormously. But, you know, you want a critic support for a film. Uh, there are certain films that require less critical support, shall we say, that, are, that the term critic proof comes up. But obviously, wherever possible, you want the support of a review, you want the support of a positive review, and, and therefore a positive attitude from a critic. Um, I don't know that obviously they are quite as important as they were, once were, but they're still, they're still very valid, I would say. And is the use to which you're putting them, does it basically come down to, I mean, is it as straightforward as poster quotes and star ratings on the po uh, um, or is there more? Well, look, I think, listen, I think the reality is, for example, I looked at the Shio Barnard's film, The Selfish Giant, a couple of years ago, which is a film that had almost across the board universal critical acclaim. Indeed, you're rather pissed off that you know, only gave it four stars instead of five. Um, it went to Cannes, glowing reviews, we got a fair amount of publicity for it and moving into its release period. There wasn't a huge amount spent on advertising, but nevertheless, the reviews again were ecstatically good. I mean, across the board, really. The film still didn't work. So, you know, the support of a critic, the support of a positive review is incredibly important, but unfortunately, it does not mean to say that the film will be a success. I mean, I think that's a peculiarity of this country, necessarily. And with that particular film, I think once people sensed that it was quite a tough watch, which undoubtedly it was, however well reviewed it was, uh, it, the film didn't work. So, a critic has enormous influence still, but not necessarily the, the ability to be able to turn people uh, towards the cinema. And you said you thought that was a peculiarity of this country. Yeah, what I did you do, mean actually. That? That's odd. Well, I just think our attitude towards film is still relatively primitive in this country. Um, I don't think we have, it's a cliche, but I don't think we have, quite like the French, for example, this inbuilt love of cinema. And I think they're much more willing to take risks, the French cinema guys. Uh, not just France, but I think the European, the Poles, for example, have a very, very good uh, record in terms of art house appreciation. So I don't think that um, our attitude is, is quite the same here. Um, I worked years ago on Tim Roth's film, The War Zone, which is an extremely bleak black and white film, a very, very tough subject matter. And I remember that we had fantastic reviews coming out of the Berlin Film Festival. It was unusual insofar as it was then chosen to go to Cannes as well. And this is a film that we knew that without good reviews, we were absolutely sunk because it's not a film that you go to for great pleasure, as has been said. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful film, so it's pleasurable in that regard. Um, and uh, actually the attitude towards the film changed a little bit at the end and we didn't get the reviews that we'd hoped for and the film didn't work. So in other words, what I'm saying, despite what I've said about The Selfish Giant, you absolutely need to have that, that, positive, that positive feedback from critics on those slightly artier films, those more art house films. Famously, of course, a, a bigger budget film, a so-called blockbuster, a so-called studio film, for example, really doesn't need it because the marketing, the advertising spend, the use of the trailer, etc., etc., the, the plethora of editorial coverage will probably outweigh the reviews. And I think most people, if they're going to see, dare I say it, something that might resemble a piece of schlock, aren't necessarily looking for a critical endorsement before they pay out their money for it. Why do you think that studios still invite critics to see you know, so-called critic, critic proof films? Well, often they don't, uh, or quite often they don't. Um, because I think they want that patina of coverage. I mean, the review is a fair degree of coverage, uh, apart from anything else. Um, so I think they, they, they will want to try and do that unless they sense that it's just going to be a complete dog's dinner and a massacre. Uh, and then they will do what they can to fight shy of it. I mean, I think the other thing to say is that these days, with the best one in the world, what I think is important in terms of review is that you get a decent uh, amount of space in a paper, uh, online as well as the same thing. Hopefully use of a really strong still. And I think most people actually really look at the headline, they look at the photograph, they get a sense as they open the paper of what there is there. Um, and they will probably look at the dreaded star rating that, that it's given. And if they go beyond that, they may read the first paragraph, they may read the final paragraph for some kind of summation. But I think rarely, sorry guys, but it's rare that a review is actually read through, I think in detail and weighed up. So it's, a review is an important part of the kind of vibe that is created around the film, let's face it. I mean, you know, so we are working very hard to get coverage as much as we can across the board. But the truth of the matter is that you, your average punter, your average consumer is probably going to 
glimpse maybe uh, a poster on a tube, they may see the headline of an editorial that we place, they may hear something on the radio, they may glimpse a couple of reviews, and that's probably it. So I think the size of the review, and dare I say it, the stars, are uh, very, very important. Um, what from, from a purely professional standpoint, mm. as opposed to mm. from a user mm. standpoint, would you like to see in the film criticism that you read? Well, what I'd like to see really is a bit more risk taken. And I don't think that's necessarily the critic's fault. In other words, I would like the critic... I mean, it's true to say that I think Peter Bradshaw has a fair amount of say on what he chooses as his film of the week. And that's fantastic oxygen for a smaller film, shall we say. So it would be very nice to see more space given to, dare I say it, more challenging films. Whereas, you know, simply debunking the latest blockbuster is, is great fun but it's too easy and it gives all that wonderful space to something that really doesn't need it. So I would say from that point of view, that's, uh, that would be incredibly important and something that uh, could really, really help less obvious films, dare I say. I think, I, mean, I suspect in a way you've already answered this question, but um, I was going to say, you know, conversely, are there things that critics do that really annoy you from a professional standpoint? Like, what do you dislike about what critics do? Well, I think... I mean, it's fine. Obviously, the critic is, by definition, an individual view. It's a personal view on a film, and I totally respect that. I wouldn't, you know, that, that's what it is. They're not reflecting the paper, they're reflecting their own views, and I respect that. But I think sometimes critics are destructive and take great pride in that and take great fun in that. They may be encouraged by the editors to do that, but I think that, generally speaking, an enormous amount of effort and sweat and blood has gone into the making of a film. And I think it needs a little bit of constructive criticism. It may not be a great film. Uh, they may disagree with the film. They may disagree with the attitude that it takes, etc. But I think a little bit of constructive criticism. Um, it doesn't happen all the time. But when you get that just pure destruction, which sometimes happens, it's, it's very cruel. Um, the other thing that I would say is the reality these days is that quite a lot of reviews and from major newspapers are written not from having seen the film in a screening room but actually a screening link uh, and I think increasingly this is becoming something that is the norm. I know there's an enormous amount of pressure on critics these days, um, they have a lot to do in a very confined space of time and I'm the first one to send a screening link if it makes life easier. I'd much rather they see it in those less than ideal circumstances than not see the film and not review it. But it's a shame. I think we're all human if we're stuck in a room where all you have to do is to concentrate on what's in front of you. Then I think you're more than likely going to see the film in a better light than you are. However dedicated and professional you are, if you're sitting down at home on a computer, you think your mind perforce is going to wander. You're going to think, let's have a cup of tea or whatever. Um, and it's quite shocking. I mean, I had a film in Sundance a couple of years ago and I watched the, the interviews that were done uh, during that period of time. And it was glaringly obvious to me that most of the interviewers had not seen the film at all. And this is really becoming the norm, I'm afraid. So, a couple of things. I don't know if this is any reassurance, but if I get a screener, which I often do, I will always watch the screener twice, which is something I can't do with a, with a film in our cinema. But um, well, you're very dedicated, and I think, listen, don't get me wrong, I'm not slagging all critics off. I think uh, they are mostly extremely professional. Um, but I think it's just sad that, uh, you know, there is, I mean, part of it is because there's now, you know, upwards of 18 films a week being released. And for those critics that, that decide they're going to try and review most of the films, if not all of the films, it's very difficult to cram all those screenings in. So I, I understand it, but I think it's a shame. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Um, it's, it's often said that Peter, Bra uh, Peter Bradshaw can review, can, can sink a film, or can, you know, break film if it's an art house film. Um, how important are critics really to films box office success or failure? I, I realise you have actually answered this question, but on... on Look, there's no doubt that um, good reviews across the board, a big Peter Bradshaw review, a film of the week review for a smaller film, uh, the other critics are just as important, I think, it makes a huge difference, there's no doubt about it, but it does not mean that a film will be successful. It's as simple as that. And if you go back a little bit to a film like London to Brighton, for example, which had, which was plucked from relative obscurity, had a succession of fantastically positive reviews. But the film wasn't a success, mainly because despite those good reviews, it was impossible to find space in the cinemas for the film. So good reviews are absolutely to be desired, 
but they're, they're not the be all and end all. Okay. Um, you've been involved in PR since the early 80s. Yeah. Um, how has PR's relationship to film critics changed? Over, like, what have been the big changes that have taken place over the decades? And I guess in particular, since the advent of the internet, but um, um, I don't know that the I don't know that the nature of the relationship has really changed. I mean, you know, I may be I may be uh, uh, you know different from other people, but I mean, I have great respect for what it is that they do. Um, I think the relationship is, is very similar to what it was. I would say that generally the critics these days are marginally less scary than uh, than they used to be. Um, that's maybe because I was quite a bit younger at that stage, and I was a little overawed by some of them who would come into the national press shows and would uh, uh, be quite demanding about certain things that they needed and special seats that they needed and complaining about some of their smelly confrères that were in there. Uh, so that was quite uh, quite intimidating at times. But um, no, I mean, I think uh, that basically the relationship is exactly as it was, quite frankly. Um, I mean, one thing that is a useful thing is that I worked on, for example, 45 years last year and Having seen that film, it seemed obvious to me that it was a film that was likely to get very positive critical reviews. So we pre-screened it quietly before the Berlin Film Festival, and um, that worked quite nicely. A, it gives the critics an opportunity, those that are Berlin bound, to see the film in fairly ideal circumstances, um, and as comfortably as possible, and without there being you know, another dozen films around them that they'll have seen in those first two days. Um, and we gleaned from that screen that the reaction was indeed very positive towards the film. So it means that the director then goes to the festival, confident that at least you know the UK critics are going to be pretty positive about the film. The other good piece of news, of course, of the film is that if you're a Swedish journalist, for example, going to Berlin, you're the Dagens Nyheter guy or whatever it may be, you're going to talk to Peter Bradshaw or Kate Muir and say, so what have you seen? I see there's a British film competition. Have you seen it? What do you think? And if they respond in a positive light, which I think they did do in this instance, which I know they did, that's a fantastic incentive and a great help to sell the film in Sweden because, of course, the Swedish distributors talk to their journalists just as British distributors will get a sense of what the reviews will be like in this country. So, uh, you know, we try and engineer things if we can that way as well. And do you, um, again, from your professional perspective, yeah. um, is there any difference between professional and amateur critics and print and online critics? Like, do you value them all in the same way, or...? Um, yeah, I mean, I, do, I try not to treat anybody different, I wouldn't have thought. I mean, obviously, self-evidently, those critics that are the main critics are the most influential. However, you want uh, as many of those critics as possible. And I don't really come across a lot of amateur critics. I don't know how you define an amateur critic. If an amateur critic is reviewing for you know, a less stellar website, he's still performing a professional job as far as I'm concerned. So I don't mark them out as professionals. Um, I don't, yeah, I mean, don't, we don't, I mean, obviously we would give precedence to the kind of key critics, of course, and try and ensure that they are, they're treated in the best way possible. But um, no, I don't, you know, we don't deliberately sort of grade people as far as that's concerned, no. I know, the, the, why are print journalists prioritized by some film campaigns and bloggers by others? Like, what, what would be the kind of thinking Well, I mean, I think this is a little old-fashioned in a way. I mean, the truth of the matter is that, you know, Peter Bradshaw is just as much of an online journalist, frankly, if not more, than you know, your average blogger. I mean, the, the differentiation between online publicity and offline publicity is, in my area has really disappeared, as far as I'm concerned. It's impossible now to simply work on the offline publicity for a film you know, without knowing anything about online, because it's all completely mixed up. Um, having said that, I hear what you say. I mean, I think that the, the inference from that is that, um, should we say, a less formal film um, is probably going to be more appreciated by the blogger end of things, and a more formal film, perhaps a more challenging film, is going to be more appreciated by the more formal critics uh, on, on the broadsheet. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I think it's rare that a film will necessarily simply say, right, that's a blog, so we won't invite the likes of Bobby Collin or Kate Muir or whatever to it. Yeah, okay, okay that's very clear. Um, there's been a, a recent trend for certain campaigns um, to quote tweets from the general public um, on films, on the post campaigns, either alongside or even in place of quotes from critics. And um, is professional film criticism losing its authority when it comes to promoting films in any way? You've already actually suggested that it isn't, but... Um 
Well, look, I mean, I think that if that's the case, the public aren't stupid. You know, they will recognise that the quotes are not coming from a critic, they're coming from Joe Blow in the street or whatever. And I think that they will judge those those tweets and those reviews and those, those quotes in that particular way. Um, uh, as I've said before, I mean, I, d I just think reviews are important, but not essential. It's quite important, quite possible for a film to succeed without great reviews, but it's also quite possible for a film to fail with cracking reviews as well. So, uh, having said that, uh, you know, um, reviews are still a, certainly part of a campaign that I would want on my side, good reviews, of course. Um, with the advent of the, the World Wide Web and, and social media, um, there's, there's never been more chatter about films, and we often get chatter about films, um, a very, very public discourse about films, even before their production has started. Mm. Um, do you see much difference between this kind of, you know, can we call it random online noise, and the arguably more considered voices of critics? Um, I mean, which is which is better for business? Do they both are they both useful? For I think they both have their play. Absolutely. I mean, I'm working on a film in production at the moment, and already, almost without trying, there's a lot of social media coverage about it, which is fine. I mean, I personally feel that. Coverage, you know, a year away from the film's release, frankly speaking, isn't really worth an awful lot. I just don't don't think that other than the dedicated yeah. followers are going to say, oh, hang on, didn't I read a tweet about that a year ago? I must go and see it. Um, so I don't think that, um, uh, I think that sort of noise, there's nothing wrong with it, but I don't think it really makes a huge amount of difference. Um, timing is timing though is very important and I think also with a more challenging film what you want to try and achieve is a situation where your target audience which for a more art house film is going to be a little bit more discerning is that there's a great danger of overhype as far as that's concerned and I think what you need to do is to lead them towards the film but let them discover it and it's a quite a hard thing to explain to a rabid hungry ambitious distributor um, but I think if they're sensible for a film like that that's the way to go. There's no doubt, I'm sure probably you yourself, sometimes if you, you're hearing about a film and you hear about it too much, it's like, okay, enough already. If I hear another thing about this, I'm supposed to love it. It means that I think when you go into the cinema, and this is the danger about overhype with a critic as well, of course, is that I'm not saying they will go in with malice or forethought, but there's no doubt they're only human. If they've been told and have ran down their throat that this film is the greatest thing since sliced bread, they are likely, especially if they're a bit knackered, to say they're, you know, sit there and say, right, well, come on then, dazzle me. So that, that welter of early coverage sometimes, I think, can have a bit of a, a, a less than positive impact. Okay, thank you very much. I think that I'm done with my questions. Um, really? But, um, but I should ask, do you have, are there any kind of... Um, anecdotes to, uh, about encounters that you had with Christians that you care to share. <laughs> I mean, I realise that's a ridiculously vague question, but I'll... Um, yeah, sure, I mean... There's, there's, there's one thing that used to happen uh, at well, film festivals, actually outside of film festivals, is that this business of PRs being asked to gather people's reactions after a film. Mm -hmm. And I, you've got to be very, very careful about doing that. I think there's nothing worse than a critic being grabbed after a screening and peremptorily asked what they thought of it. Because we all know, without sounding very arty, that Sometimes a film, your opinion about it doesn't actually crystallise within the minute you get out of the cinema. You genuinely need a little time to uh, to kind of to drink it all in. Um, but we sometimes are asked to deliver literally written reactions within ten minutes of the end of the film. And much though we fight against it, it's it's something that it's done less now than it was, but it was certainly prevalent at one stage. And I'll never forget in Venice, in fact, after the end of one particular screening, we'd warned of a whole army of people who were sent out to do this particular job and it was not so bad for us because we know the international press quite well we know who to approach and who not to approach but one poor unfortunate woman uh, I remember came up to the guy who was reviewing the film for Variety and as you know there's an unspoken rule about the trade reviews though to be taken particularly seriously and you really can't grab the mask and what you think afterwards they are not really allowed to give you a hint but this poor girl literally stopped this guy from coming out of the cinema and said, so, you know, what did you think of the film with 
with a pencil and notepad uh, raised and he was really quite pissed off about it. And the film, the, re the review that he wrote wasn't terribly positive about the film. Now that may well be a reflection of the film, but also, again, psychologically, I think that can't have helped the situation, shall we say. Um, so that that's something I remember back in the old days, there was a, uh, a critic called Alexander Walker <laughs> from the <laughs> Standard, who was quite, quite uh, scary to a junior publicist. And he would invariably arrive late at the National Press Show. And what you had to do to keep an eye out, because you knew that in each particular cinema, in each particular preview room, he had a seat that he particularly liked. And um, so you would do your best to keep that seat free, but occasionally, there would be a late flurry of people and you know that Alex Walker hadn't turned up and uh, you would you're, you would be pretty concerned that he would come in and then he would kick off hugely if he wasn't in the seat that he was. And another one, uh, an ex-Guardian and Evening Standard reviewer, uh, who was actually a really lovely guy and very benign, but at that stage there were a lot of what we call Polish war veteran type critics who I have no idea really who, wrote, who they wrote for, who they actually reviewed for, but they invariably turned up ate the sandwiches and sat down and watched the films. Um, one guy in particular was quite notorious and I remember in the old ranked screening room uh, this guy came out, well this, this critic came out to me just as the film was starting and said look I can't do this I'm afraid the guy next door is taking his shoes off and is taking his socks off and it's just too much I can't bear the smell can you do something about it? So I had to go in and tap this poor unfortunate guy on the shoulder and usher him out uh, without causing too much of a fuss. So, um, yeah, beware of the smelly socks. And that's how they were known, these, these also rounds, I think. Um, beyond that, not that I can particularly think of, no. I don't know whether that, that helps. No, it does, it really does. It's, 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 it's funny because I guess now, um, apart from the select few newspaper critics, although perhaps this is no different from the way it's always been, we're all also Rams, right? We're all kind of struggling to, to become them in effect. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well I mean I think it's it's a really, really tough situation yeah. out there. I mean, the, you know, the freelance world is, frankly, is no more. I mean, other than reviewers. Um, I mean, I would, there are a number of really good freelance, more feature writers that I would write to about ideas. And then we, you know, I would think of a freelance that was suited to a particular film, but I thought would react positively to a film. And we talk about what positive angles there were, what possible interviews there were. And he or she would then go and talk to various newspapers that they, they wrote for, but that's, no longer possible. I mean, the, the, the number of freelancers that are used regularly by the broadsheets is, is minimal. And it's very, very, very tough out there. Extremely tough. And I get the impression from what you say that, that quite a lot of your work has involved um, tracking films to festivals. Like you take films to yeah. festivals and introduce them yeah. To, yeah. Uh, to their very initial audiences yeah. to, to drum up support from distributors. And that's, so is that kind of...? Yes, I mean... Uh, Festivals are tricky, there's no doubt about it. Something like Cannes is really a new story in itself. And so the writers, the film writers, are very much looking for newsy elements, newsy angles on the films that launch there. And I'll never forget, we worked on Sophia Coppola's film, Marie Antoinette. And uh, at the press screening, there were genuinely six or eight people, no more, that booed the film at the end. There were at least as many that applauded and cheered for the film. But because of the nature of this, you know, Tyro American indie director taking on, you know, such an icon of, of French history, there was already a lot of interest as far as that was concerned, and so they leapt on the fact that the film was booed, and that became, if you like, the epithet of the film, the film that was booed at Cannes. And once that initial idea is kind of out there, it's incredibly difficult to row back from that. So it became the film that was booed at Cannes, and even, even though my understanding is months and months later. And actually, the, the critical reaction to the film was pretty good, uh, genuinely pretty good. So that's really frustrating. There's a you know there's a limit to what you can really do to offset that. Once that's there, it's it's extremely hard to row back from that. Are there ways that you can turn that sort of notoriety to your to your advantage? Like um, not really. I think Brown Bunny tried to do that. <laughs> um, not really. No. I mean, I think you no. Know, I think I think customers want to go and see a film. 
uh, not that they're going to be led and, and just simply go and go and see any, the only things they'll go and see are well reviewed but if a film has been booed at Cannes as far as they're concerned then it probably isn't very good and it's going to be difficult for them to go I think. But am I right in thinking that actually booing a film at Cannes is sort of conventional? <laughs> like that happens quite a um, lot? Well it, does, it doesn't happen infrequently certainly. Um, but I mean, there's another film I remember in Cannes, <coughs> Jim Jarmusch's film, Dead Man, and I worked regularly with Jim. Uh, and it was quite late at the festival. And the critics, like everybody, after a week in Cannes are exhausted. Yeah. I mean, totally exhausted. And I was concerned because this screen late on, very late on in the festival, it is, it is deliberately a very soporific film. That's what it's all about. The rhythm of the film, if you've seen it, is, is very much about that. And I remember sitting watching it and um, just people were nodding off left, right and centre. And at one stage I remember one guy sort of got up and shouted, Jim, this is shit. Yeah, so that was, uh, you know, an instance of, of, of the kind of, if you like, the physical circumstance of a festival having a very negative impact on a film. So in that instance, what we had to do really was just to sort of try and put can behind us. Uh, and start some months later afresh with the film, say, look, come and see it now, less tired, etc., etc., and, and, and see the film for what it is. And that kind of worked to a certain extent. But the festival, the festival launch is incredibly important, critically. And um, are there ways in which you... I mean, I, I guess what you're saying is that, that you would have been greatly served by having that film screening earlier. Yes. Can, can you, do you have any control or say in the scheduling? Mm, a little bit. Um, it's it's very tough. Uh, some films have to perform a screen at the end of the festival. Yeah. Uh, one useful thing is that if your you know big name stars can only attend on X day and Y day because they're shooting elsewhere, that obviously helps. The festival have to look to try and balance the festival as much as they possibly can. They're looking for a very strong weekend, uh, but they know that they have to keep things up their sleeve for later on. And I don't think it's choice at the end of the, of the uh, festivals necessarily just debunking the film. Indeed, quite a lot of films have gone on, like Underground, having screened right at the end and won the Palm Door. Um, but into, I'm thinking about from the critic's point of view, from the film journalist's point of view, it's, it's an assault course, that place. It really is. And uh, how dedicated they are, if a film is, is you know, somnambulantly paced, um, it's going to be a struggle. I mean, like, personally, I adored it, man, but like, how did it do? <laughs> you mean, what, at its box office eventually? Yeah. Or? Like, it, did, it did pretty well. I mean, it did well, um, but it's a long film, and it's a slow film, um, and so it's, it, it probably isn't his biggest uh, earner, I would have thought. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. It's indeed. a pleasure.